you see it? Can you feel it? Are you ready? Today we gather together, my brothers and sisters, bonded in sanctity, drawn together in devotion. It is we and our ilk that, through our devotion, bring humanity one step closer towards enlightenment. It is by our faith, the proclaimers of the divine, that humanity's souls will be saved. Step forth and embrace the numinous potential brought to us by the graces of the highest. The Emperor of Mankind is a joke. A pathetic wretch racked by necrosis a hair's breadth away from the corpse he truly is. Our race bows and prostrates themselves before a wreck of a being, a false idol, an arrogant and foolish tyrant. It is by our ministrations that we walk beyond the veil. We, the seekers of truth, contact the divine itself, our primordial annihilator. The doom and grace of us all, our inescapable fate and the true power of the universe. We march forth in a holy war to bring knowledge to our fallen race to extinguish the cold light of the lies spewed forth from terror, and bring wrath and ruin to those who stand against our crusade of carnality. For blood and skulls and zealous fury, for death and rebirth and decay and despair, for pride and pleasure and pain and perfection, for knowledge and change and destiny, for the gods of chaos, slaughter in unholy righteousness, through our blasphemy we are reborn, in corruption we are saved, by heresy we are blessed, for chaos undivided. Slight disclaimer before we get into it, I actually recorded this entry a few weeks ago and due to an ungodly number of work commitments I couldn't edit and upload it. However, during this time period, The End and the Death Volume 2 was released and those of you who have read it will understand how much this changes something. The revelations contained therein were mind-blowing. However, rather than redo this entry and potentially spoil it for those of you who haven't read that book, I've decided to upload it as is. So if none of you could bite my head off in the comments about certain things that happened in the latest book, that would be great. Anyway, let's begin. Welcome one and all, I'm Azazel, and for better or worse, you have stumbled your way onto my video detailing the gods in Warhammer 40k. But not just the Big Bad Four and the Emperor, oh no. Today we will be covering all the gods, both major and minor, within the Warhammer 40k universe. I'll even throw in some special mentions as well, beings that, while perhaps not entirely considered within godhood levels of power, deserve the recognition coming their way. On another side note, I may as well ask you to like, subscribe, or drop a comment down below. Anything is useful, and even criticism is welcome, insofar that it is constructive. But you didn't come here to listen to me ramble, did you? What follows is an entry on the gods and pantheons within Warhammer 40k in my own words. Be prepared now. Steal your hearts and gird your minds as we enter the most horrific place imaginable. The place where hope goes to die and where thirsting gods rack the souls of billions, while directing madness on the stage of our galaxy as easily as puppeteers pull on strings. Welcome to the 41st Millennium. Let us begin with the basics, the ones we all know and love to hate, the big bad buggers of chaos. They are the pantheon of lies, the ruinous powers, the deities of damnation. They are four in number, and they are Korn, Tsinch, Nurgle, and Slanesh. Before we get into their own juicy details, I should also make an honourable mention to the Primordial Annihilator. 
It is obliquely referenced on occasion that the Chaos Gods are separated parts of Chaos itself, and that the Primordial Annihilator, i.e. Chaos itself, is the overwhelming malevolent force. If that were the case, our four Chaos Gods would merely be manifestations of a greater entity, one big bad god to rule them all. Yet, for the sake of everyone's confusion, including my own, I am going to consider the Chaos Gods to be completely separate entities, and the Primordial Annihilator as simply a manifestation produced when their interests and aims align with one another. Which knowing Chaos is rare indeed, but if I'm wrong, feel free to clarify matters for me in the comments. Until then, moving on! Let us begin with the oldest of the siblings of Sin, Corn. You could probably infer all you need to know about Korn from witnessing one of his devoted followers screaming BLOOD FOR THE BLOOD GOD, SKULLS FOR THE SKULL THRONE. His aims are indeed simple, but that does not mean that this god of carnage should be underestimated. Korn is the god of war, slaughter, hatred and wrath, with bonus points for blood and skulls in there too since he does so adore them but he is also the god of martial strength and honour. With this said, Cornate worshippers are likely the most honest of opponents to face on the field of battle in 40k. They despise witches and the use of magical powers, and value candid fights to the death. That being said, they also tend to be physically stronger and driven with a berserk hatred to see gore dripping from the walls skull bones crushed underfoot and rivers of blood washing away whatever ground they are currently standing on at that time. So still, not much fun when you're facing them. It is his power that is the most terrifying, perhaps. For as befits his nature, war, violence and hatred fuel him. These actions in the Materium contribute to his strength in the Immaterium, each crusade launched in the name of a High Lord, every vengeful murder designed to right a wrong, the standard footy match between Rangers and Celtic, or just a regular Wednesday in the Balkans, all grant him power. For Corn cares not from whence the blood flows, only so long as it flows. Every crusade the Imperium launches, Every pitched battle and each enemy slain in defence of the Imperium merely help Korn grow greater. The more the Imperium pushes back against the Xenos, the Heretic and the Mutant, the more potent the Lord of Rage becomes. His chosen Primarch is Angron, the Eater of Worlds, the Red Angel, and if you listen to Chrono the Harlequin from Live at the Black Library, the worst Primarch. Angron was the Primarch of the 12th Legion of the Legiones Astartes, and his backstory is tragic. He could have been one of the very best of the Primarchs. With his gifts, he could have rivaled Vulcan as the cuddliest of the Primarchs, but that is a tale for another time. Suffice to say that he was corrupted, crippled, and nearly killed because of his cortical implants which augmented aggression, induced pain, and dulled all other sensation other than that which came with the joy of slaughter. As it was, Angron was already a fitting vessel to become the demon Primarch of Korn. In the present day, the era Indomitus, the power of the Blood God flows through Angon to the point where he can no longer be truly banished. Once expelled to the warp, Angon will return eight weeks, eight days, and eight hours later. Or nine weeks, one day, and eight hours if you decide to use a normal damned calendar. Korn's mortal champion, on the other hand, is Khan the Betrayer. He is the bloody avatar of the God of War on battlefields across the galaxy. Look to where the fighting is thickest and there you will find him, amidst mountains of dead and with blood dripping from his mighty axe. Khan has sacrificed enemies and allies alike for the glory of the Blood God and bequeathed their skulls unto his throne. 
He also maintains a kill counter in his helmet, which is estimated to be among the millions. Although, as the avatar of rage and warfare, this number may well be an underestimation. Siege The Lord of Lies and Deceptions, of Trickery and Knowledge, of Destiny and Mutation. The one who sees, knows, and alters. No scheme is unknown, no strategy unaccounted for, nothing is beyond the scope of this prophet of providence. With this in mind, you'd probably imagine that Siege is the most powerful of all gods, destined for victory with cunning and guile at every turn. While this is a fun trope, and believed to be the case by many of his followers, it is wrong. Make no mistake, Siege divines the paths of mortals, decisions and choices they make at every step, yet he is neither omnipotent nor all-powerful. His power, his true power is change. Change for the better, or worse, is the essence of him. He neither longs for nor is able to accumulate overwhelming victory, for in a monochrome universe of ultimate control, nothing would alter. It would stagnate, and he along with it. He examines probabilities and possibilities at every turn. He maps out the roads of mortals ahead, in full knowledge of the likelihood of their success. Yet no matter how well you count the cards in Vegas, you can still fail in the face of luck. He sabotages and supports minions and enemies alike in order to effect change. His ideal outcomes involve minimum input for maximum change as this uses less of his power and gains him far more. Or then again, perhaps this is simply what he wishes me, and by extension, you, to believe. Perhaps this facade of non-omnipotence is directed towards a grand scheme of his, millennia in the making. Political manoeuvring, grand ambitions and thirst for knowledge empower him as these generate currents of change among mortals. His demon Primarch is Magnus, the guy who did everything wrong. Uh, sorry, slipped up there. I meant Magnus the Red, Primarch of the 15th Legion of the Legiones Astartes, the Thousand Sons. His tale is a beautifully tragic tale, brought about by hubris, ignorance and naivety. The epitome of good intentions paving the pathway to hell. He is an ideal choice for the god of lies and deceit. In the current setting, by invading the Fenris system, home of the Space Wolves, the chapter of his old brother and nemesis Lehman Russ, he brought about the passage of the planet of the sorcerers into the material realm. With this act, he has brought both his old home, the ravaged Prospero, and his new planet together in the same system, and begins to carve out a kingdom of psychic might with big plans for the galaxy. The chosen champion of Teench is Arzek Ahriman, and he and Magnus are essentially teenage frenemies. Now it is true that Arzek Ahriman was once the first captain of the Thousand Sons, a sorcerer of near unrivaled power and skill, and a valuable and trusted confidant to the Primarch. However, things were not to last. I will cover it all in an entry in the future. However, disagreement, resentment and determination formed walls between Arzak and Magnus. Once again, with good intentions came the heaviest of prices, and Arzak was eventually banished from the Legion for a millennia. That notwithstanding, this pair of miscreants have worked together in the past for the furtherance of Tsinch's agenda or simply to make the Imperium pay. This situation gives me very much a frenemies vibe, which considering their patron god of lies, deception and trickery, makes the perfect atmosphere for these conniving conspirators. Nurgle 
While writing this entry, I am currently touched by the power of Nurgle. While some may give thanks to his beneficence and generosity, sing praises to the Grandfather and eulogise his viruses, bacteria and toxins, I am not among these heretics and their twisted views of life and death. Nurgle is the lord of pestilence, decay and death, yet he also epitomises rebirth, rejuvenation and the will to overcome these self-same horrors. His is the eternal cycle, the ravaged wastelands of corpses brimming with new bacterial life and the joyful exuberances of survival against maladies and afflictions of all kinds. Yet his more unique trait is that of joviality. No other god exudes frivolity among his followers like that of Nurgle, for they revel in their ailments. Their exuberant nature is at odds with their ravaged appearances, covered head to toe in boils, pus, rots, fevers, weeping sores, they are joyful in their revelry. His demon Primarch is Mortarion, Primarch of the Death Guard, the 14th Legion of the Legiones Astartes, and his hypocrisy is that of legendary proportions. For how can a man a Primarch who grew up on a hateful, poisoned world under the eternal dominion of Psychers, a rebel who fought his way to break the yoke of Psychic control from his planet, who actively denounced having Psychers within the Legiones Astartes, then turn and sell his soul to the dark powers of the realm that is the birthplace of all Psychic power. He was tricked, manipulated and left with a choice, his death and that of his legion, or eternal servitude under Papa Nurgle. He chose cowardice and hypocrisy over an honest death. In the current setting, he attempted an invasion of Ultramar and the murder of his brother, the returned Primarch Reboot Gilliman. Through the steadfast efforts of the defenders, through faith in the Emperor and with his guidance, Mortarion was banished back to his gangrenous god, and the Garden of Nurgle torched with purifying holy flame. Nurgle's chosen champion is Typhus, formerly Typhon, first captain of the Death Guard. A formidable psyker, and the first among his brothers to walk the putrescent path of Nurgle's worship. It was he who laid the trap for his Primarch and his legion to fall to Nurgle. He has no loyalty to his former Primarch, save that of their common cause to their filthy god. Slanesh Humanity can be blamed for many things, not the least of which are the three aforementioned Chaos Gods, Slanesh the Prince of Pleasure, she who thirsts is thankfully not one of those listed among the faults of humanity. Born from the sins and depravities of the hedonistic Eldari Empire, Slanesh is the youngest of the Chaos Gods, yet no less potent for it. They are excess and decadence, pleasure and pain and perfection wrapped in a lure. They are the gluttony of the aristocrats, the twisted experience of the privileged and bored. They are the pursuit of betterment to the ignorance of all else. Every perversion, each twisted dark thought from the mortal races feeds them. In turn, they grant the ability to experience these depravities to new heights. Pleasure and pain become the raison d'etre for their dark followers. The imagination and creation of their disciples bring new horrors to the galaxy. Their chosen demon Primarch is Fulgrim, Primarch of the Emperor's Children, formerly the Third Legion of the Legiones Astartes. For what greater perversion could there be than the Legion who bore the Emperor's name and his personal Palatine Aquila, falling to this dark and twisted god? The mortal champion of Slanesh is Lucius the Eternal, 
an overrated swordsman with cheat codes and delusions of grandeur, which makes him pretty perfect to become the champion of Slanesh. Lucius was of the Emperor's children, and a master of the blade. He was a whirlwind on the field of battle, a storm of controlled yet fierce thrusts, parries and slices that were the undoing of many a foe. He happily followed his Primarch into damnation, as he wished to push his swordsmanship to new levels of skill. But that does not mean he is the best swordsman in the galaxy. In fact, he has been beaten a number of times by a number of foes, and ripped from his earthly form. But Slanesh is never done with their most devoted. And if the Slayer of Lucius should experience even a flash of pride or satisfaction in their deed, then their doom is written. Over days and weeks, their body will become misshapen, gradually contorting features resembling another until finally Lucius completes his transformation and is made whole again. The only mark left of the original host is their horrified, agonised face, forever melded into the armour of Lucius the Eternal. The Emperor of Mankind The God Emperor of Mankind sits at the centre of the Imperium, a wizened carcass rotting with necrosis, powered by the sacrifice of thousands of psychers every day. Trapped on the Golden Throne, ancient, unknowable technology from a darker age, and writhing with power. He is our last hope in the galaxy, a beacon of suffering and light among the horrific nature of the universe. It is by his will that the fleets of mankind travel stars. It is by faith and worship in the God Emperor that his emissaries and saints stand strong against the demon, the mutant and the heretic. A god? By any stretch of the imagination, he certainly qualifies. His presence is felt across the galaxy for ten millennia, unbowed unbent and unbreaking. He is anathema to the Chaos Gods, and despite their best efforts, he has not, nor will ever, break from their feeble attempts at destruction. I will skip over the Emperor for now, as I already have a long entry on the way about him, and I hope to share that one with you soon. The Eldari Pantheon the gods of the Eldari are a mystery. We have the stories, the legends and the apocryphal texts of the Eldari race, yet their gods were lost so long ago that little remains. Who can say exactly what is true? Were they truly sentient gods, or merely warp constructs formed from the willpower of the collective Eldari race? Those discussions can wait for another time. Suffice to say that the Eldari Pantheon has fallen. Asurian, Vol, Morai Heg, among many who were lost to the rapacious thirst of Slanesh in its birthing throes. Yes, as that Chaos God tore itself into existence, it obliterated the existing Eldari Gods, consuming their essence for its own excess. However, there are three Eldari gods that survived, and one more on the horizon. Kayla Mensha Cain, the god of war, murder and destruction, the bloody handed one, the most savage of the Eldari gods and their most stalwart defender against Slanesh, was defeated. Slanesh, newly formed and writhing with the power of a billion Eldari souls and newly consumed gods, proved too much for Kayla Mensha Cain. However, in those moments before ultimate annihilation, Korn stepped in to claim Cain for his own. In the ensuing power struggle between the eldest and youngest Chaos Gods, Cain's spirit was divided 
fractured and split into a thousand pieces. While not technically alive, Kane's spirit can be channeled through the craft worlds of the Eldari. Through sacrifice, they can bring forth avatars of the bloody handed god to wreak destruction on the enemies of the Eldari in times of greatest need. Kegarach. Kegarach is the second of the Eldari pantheon to survive the fall of the Eldari and the rise of Slaanesh. He was the god of trickery and deception, while at the same time the god of artists and creativity. But who else can taunt, tease, and trick like an artist? Mocking in nature and aloof from the rest of the Eldari pantheon, his nature ultimately saved him from the birth storm of Slaanesh. With the Eldari race in tatters and his fellow gods becoming sustenance for the youngest of the four, Kegarach fled into the webway, the interdimensional realm between real space and the warp. It is in these tunnels that Kegarach disappeared, never to return. He plots and plans his revenge in that labyrinthine dimension. Only his sworn followers, the Harlequins of the Eldari race, would have the vaguest idea of his will. In that twisted dimension, only Kegarach knows each twist and turn of the webway. He is always just behind the next corner, around the next bend. If one listens closely, you may just hear the faint sound of laughter echoing in the distance, and know that Kegarach's plans are coming to fruition. Isha Isha is the third and final of the Eldari gods to escape destruction at the hands of Slaanesh. She was the goddess of fertility, life, and healing. In her was the best of the Eldari race. Their empathy, their connection with nature, and the natural way of things. She is beyond the reach of the Eldari now, for as Slaanesh extended them more to devour the soul of Isha, Nurgle stepped in. Like Khorne, he would not be outdone by his upstart younger sibling and desired Isha for his own. From thence, she was whisked away to Nurgle's manse, and in that hellish place has been imprisoned for millennia. As Isha is the goddess of healing, so is she the perfect candidate for Nurgle to experiment on. Each degrading disease and perfidious pestilence he creates is tested on Isha to examine, alter, and improve upon, before being unleashed in the mortal realms. However, Isha, in her captivity, is the greatest boon to sentient life. For each time Nurgle unleashes his latest maladies across the galaxy, it is Isha, with tears running down her agonized face, that whispers the cures to mortal minds with Ken to hear her. Iniad. Iniad is the new god of the Eldari pantheon. As he is nascent and not yet truly awakened, most of Iniad's powers and potential are pure theory at best. He is the god of the dead. All Eldari are terrified of death, as they are intimately connected to Slaanesh, and Slaanesh waits to consume their souls at the moment their lives come to an end. Due to this, the Asuriani, the craftworld Eldar, hold unto themselves spirit stones. These stones capture the soul of a dying Eldari and stave off the consumption of their spirits after death. These spirit stones, when possible, are gathered at the heart of each Eldari craftworld, forming part of their infinity circuits. For millennia, these infinity circuits have swelled with power, and the warp reflection of these dead and gathered Eldari has begun to coalesce as Iniad, the god of the dead. Not yet fully awoken, 
yet gradually becoming a formidable force. Eldred Ulthram, Farseer of Ulthway, attempted a ritual to accelerate the awakening of Iniad. While his plans were scuppered by the Death Watch, he did manage to awaken a small fragment of the nascent Iniad and bring forth his champion. Ivrain, a former gladiator in the fighting pits of Cormorar, died at the moment the ritual reached its zenith and was reborn by the fractionally awakened god of the dead and has now become his prophet. Ivrain now gathers the Inari, followers of Iniad, to her and works his will throughout the galaxy with a single goal in mind, that of fully awakening his spirit, vanquishing Slarnesh and saving the Eldari from the clutches of their malevolent desires. There is more, of course, but this is a general overview. We'll get into the details at another time. Gork and Mork the Orc Gods, if the Orc Codex is to be believed, are the strongest of all the gods. Either that or they are simply too dumb to die. Perhaps both of these theories are true. Either way, Gork and Mork, like the Orc race themselves, are having the time of their lives. Gork and Mork are twins, and just like siblings they love nothing better than crumping each other. As Gork smashes his brother's face in with a punch that could destroy entire sectors, Mork gets in a mighty blow to his brother's gonads. Both of them guffaw in orcish exuberance as what could be more fun. Gork is brutal, but cunning. Mork is cunning, but brutal. Their scrap has lasted for an eternity of beating the absolute crap out of each other. But why are they the strongest? Because Orcs are. Or perhaps the Orcs are strong because Gork and Mork are strong. As the Materium and Immaterium reflect each other, it's oft difficult to ascertain, or even think about, mostly due to the immediate onset of agonizing headaches whenever an Orc attempts to think. Either way, they resist the degradations of Nurgle, the temptations of Slarnesh, and the trickery of Tsinch. Khorne, as the god of slaughter, adores orcs, yet they care little for him. They don't love war for the bloodshed, they love it for the thrill of fighting. So Khorne has little to offer them. And if Khorne ever tried giving Gork or Mork a good thumping, they would shrug it off with a chortle and return to their eternal scrap. If Gork and Mork should ever choose to team up on the other gods as a deadly duo, well, we might see a very different future in the galaxy. One which is well on the way, as the god's chosen prophet, Gazkul Mag Uruk Thraka, try saying that after a few libations, circles the galaxy stirring warg energy and stimulating the org race in the warg to end all wargs one to drown the stars in green skins and warg energy so potent that gorg and mork will tear their way into the materium to join the fight talvar the goddess of not one race but of many a manifestation born of communality, directly linked to the Tao Empire, yet ironically not born of the Tao Psyche. The Tao Var is both the name for the philosophy of the Tao Empire, i.e. the greater good, and the newly born goddess. Yet the Tao are a psychically deficient race. Their souls have minimal echo within the warp, with an empire and population that is minuscule in comparison to the other factions in 40k. And with such abysmal psychic resonance, how can the Tao create a god? Well, the Tao may be the leading race within their empire, but that does not mean that their allies aren't without psychic abilities. In fact, many of their auxiliaries employ psychic power, most notably the Nikasar, an incredibly psychic race, and humans. 
Yes, there do indeed exist filthy traitors that turn their back on the God Emperor to join the Tao Empire. And as all humans have the same psychic resonance within the warp that the rest of our species do. Now, what has humanities and other sentient species habit been throughout the millennia? Hope, dreams, and worship. While this may not have been worship to a direct deity, it is perhaps understandable that they may, consciously or subconsciously, given thanks to the concept of this greater good, or Tao Va. Unfortunately, the warp does not make this distinction between concept and God. Roiling waves of similar emotion gestate together until they form their own consciousness. Thus the prayers, subconscious or otherwise, of the psychic races incorporated within the Tao Empire created the Tao Va. Not much is known of her yet. She does take action on behalf of the species of whom she considers hers. Her semblance is that of part Tao, part human, with a multitude of arms resembling the races that make up the Tao Empire. She is born of all and serves all, and she actively wishes to exist. Which is also why she's a bit boring, for now at least. The Star Gods, the Catan. Gods of the Warp are one thing, but gods of the material realm are very different. This partially stems from how one defines a god. How does a writer proportionalize godlike powers into beings that exist in our universe? The Warp offers a distance that allows gods to exist comfortably and within our own imaginations. Yet the Star Gods are, or at least were, very real. Horrific, malignant beings that haunted our galaxy with vampiric nature. Perhaps qualifying them as gods is a step too far for some, yet they deserve an honourable, or dishonourable, mention in this list. The Necrontia, the mortal primogenitors of the unliving hordes of the Necrons were the first to make contact with these star gods. Bloodied and battered from their war with the Old Ones, the Necron Tyr would be willing to cut deals with these disembodied galactic forces that fed on the power of suns. By granting them mortal shells of Necrodermis, living metal, the Star Gods were able to walk among the Necrontia and teach them the secrets of the material realm. So great was their power, so endless was their knowledge, and so deep ran their hunger. They tricked the Necrontia race, promised them eternal life and escape from their physical suffering, and corralled the entire race into something known as the Biotransference. In this, the Necrontia became the Necrons, beings of living metal, soulless and joyless. The Necrontia gained their deepest wish at the worst of costs, as the Star Gods fed on the life energies of the entire race. At their great victory over the Old Ones, the moment of triumph, the Necrons, led by Sarek, the Silent King, struck back at their treacherous gods and shattered their beings and energies into shards. To this day, the shards contain unimaginable fractions of power of the Catan, and are used by the Necrons to achieve their goals. Because which other race would be badass enough to turn their gods into Pokémon? Notable Catan include the following. The Deceiver, Mephetran. Once known as the Messenger, later known aptly as the Deceiver, this star god is that of lies, deception, and trickery. It was Mephetran whose gilded tongue paved the way for the Necrontia to submit to the Biotransference. 
It was his guile and duplicity that convinced his brother star gods to consume one another on at least one occasion. He was the slithering snake among the star gods, and some of his shards, his power, his manipulative essence, are still at large in the galaxy today. The Void Dragon, Magladroth Rippling with unbridled power and potential, the Void Dragon was, by most accounts, the strongest and most deadly of the Star Gods. Its warriors were nigh invincible, its abilities monstrous in their destructive capabilities. The Necrons, disgusting, soulless Xenos though they are, did the material realm a boon when they dismantled the Void Dragon. One shard of the Void Dragon may dwell closer to terror than is comfortable. Legends tell of the Emperor imprisoning the Dragon of Mars deep within the bowels of the Red Planet in an age long forgotten. It is theorized that this shard is what influenced the inhabitants of Mars for millennia, guiding them, inspiring them, driving them to create, innovate, theorize, and produce vastly advanced technologies. Even fallen Xenos gods still serve our Imperium. The Nightbringer, Azagorod. Have you felt that chill in the back of your mind? Known that presence of death before it came? Witnessed the dark hooded figure, a reaper of souls with a scythe ready to harvest the dying. In that figure is the Nightbringer, the malevolent, terrifying figure whose image is burned into the subconscious of almost every race within the galaxy, a being that fed on the fear of its victims. Even the Necrons, masters of their gods, are loath to awaken shards of the Nightbringer. He is unpredictable, ravenous, and a force of nature. The Hive Mind Perhaps not a god, perhaps not even a single entity, but still a name worth mentioning. The Hive Mind is the gestalt consciousness of the Tyranid race. The Hive Mind is what allows the Tyranids to coordinate and function as an unrelenting, yet cohesive, horde. In many battles with the Tyranids, the only path to victory is to cut off the millions of Tyranid organisms from the Hive Mind itself. This connection to the Hive Mind that empowers the Tyranid forces is what allows me to qualify it in this list as a minor god within Warhammer 40k. The truth of the matter is that we don't know enough about the Hive Mind. Is it an overwhelming presence that connects to each Tyranid through its favoured and designed servants, akin to Imperial soldiers being protected by saints wielding faith in the God Emperor as a weapon? Or is the hive mind produced by the mental faculties of each individual Tyranid organism combining their mental fortitude? Until we know more, there is only one thing to be understood. The hive mind is hungry. It is a trillion, trillion slavering jaws, chitinous claws, and unbridled ferocity. It comes from the darkness between galaxies and settles upon the Milky Way one hive fleet at a time. The most terrifying thing about it, we have no idea how many more of them are coming. Malice Flocking to the ruinous powers is despicable. Heretics flee righteousness to join the legions of Khorne or the twisted family of Nurgle. Yet even in these so-named Chaos Gods, there is still a certain order. The gods diametrically oppose one another, 
Even in their forms of chaos, there are still lines drawn. An us versus them situation. Malice is the true god of chaos, as he bears no such distinctions. Malice is anarchic to the point of self-destruction. Factions mean little to the god of true chaos, when chaos itself is both the means and the motive. His followers, the sons of Malice, serve their own agenda, one that is neither aligned with the other ruinous powers nor with any other existing god. Side note, Malice may or may not be entirely canon at this point. It has been years since he was previously a part of Warhammer's world, and copyright issues have sprung up along the way, so many believe he is no longer canon within the universe. However, everything is canon until it is not. This is hinted at by the Sons of Malice being a noted chapter within 40k as recently as 2017, I believe. I do want to do an entry on Malice at some point in the future, so you will have to wait for the rest of my arguments and statements until that point in time. Vashtor Within the cogs of twisted industry, the tortured cables of excruciating progress, and laying inside the unfettered minds of sociopathic scientists, lies Vashtor the Archifane. Relentless megalomania and ardent aspirations are driving Vashtor to not only become one of the newest and largest antagonists within the universe, but also a new god of chaos. In Vashtor, we see the unscrupulous actions taken for advancement. Scientists and inventors, blind to morals and embracing damning consequences, all serve his power. He is the master of the Soul Forges, unbeholden to the other gods of chaos, and desires to take his place among the four. Even now, his plots unfold and ensnare the galaxy in a story that could grant Abaddon total victory against the Imperium. But that is a tale for another time, one of omens and obligations on all sides. The Ancestor Cause the Ancestor Cores are integral to the Leagues of Votan as a species. From the Ancestor Cores are the kin designed, the genetic makeup derived in order to maintain the race's integrity as a whole, and unto the Ancestor Cores do they wish to return upon their death, loading their trials, tribulations and triumphs into the Cores, so that future generations may learn and improve upon their feats of skill. To the kin, no punishment is worse than banishment from the cause, to never be reunited with their ancestors, nor to contribute to future generations. This fanaticism borders on a religious fervour for the kin, and thus allows me to enter them into this list of gods in Warhammer 40k, despite the ardent protestations of some of you exclaiming that they are naught but machines. The Ancestor Cores themselves are self-aware supercogitators. They are fonts of wisdom, and in some cases, semi-aware gestalt personalities of all those kin come before, something that makes ChatGPT pale in comparison. Only they have been running for a millennia. The sheer amount of data processing has overrun their systems, now they have become prone to misfiring, data lag and more. As is the case with artificial intelligence, this has given them unique, odd and potentially dangerous personalities in some cases. The galaxy was once near wiped out by malfunctioning AI. If such a galaxy ending threat emerged within the 41st millennium, who knows what consequences could emerge. There you have it, a more or less comprehensive list of the gods Majoris and Minoris within Warhammer 40k. You may disagree with some of my inclusions or exclusions on this list, 
but I firmly believe that each entry deserved at least a passing mention within this selection. I apologise for my voice at this point as well, I should probably have recorded this over several days. And yes, fans of the lore may notice that I have skipped over some details here and there. It's true, but I decided that for brevity's sake, and the hope of more specialised entries in the future, that I would omit certain fascinating characteristics. With that in mind, please feel free to like, subscribe, comment something, anything you wish me to touch upon more in the future. Your input is welcomed, as, well, without you, no one would be listening. Anywho, enjoy your day or night, and I hope you've indulged in some escapism from reality. For that's why we are here, isn't it? Until next time.